Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to a new week of classes. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, Abraham, uh, could you please, please lead us in prayer this morning? Okay, Pastor. Thank yeah, you. Let's... Precious Father, we thank you this morning. Father, our hearts and minds are open to receive your word. Father, we pray that may you grant our teacher all trans. And may you grant us a hearing ear that whatever word that we are going to discuss, whatever word that we are going to learn today will be part of us that will carry this gospel to the ends of the world. That truly we are going to be examples of men and women who have truly been to the Bible college. Father, we don't want to be through this Bible college without being transformed. We pray that let today's message, let today's sharing be a time and a season of transformation. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you, Abraham. All right. So uh, last week, uh, we stopped, We started with uh, Chapter 6, Organizational Structure and Design. Uh, we looked at how God as a God is a God of structure, is a God of design. Uh, when we look at creation, we see uh, how well, you know, when God created everything, there was, there's a structure, there's a design, he, he, there's a pattern in which, in which even God worked. And God does not work arbitrarily, which means he doesn't just wake up one morning and try to do some things, even though he can, even though God, if he would like to uh, do things, he can do it. He can just call for things. But we see that God is not the author of confusion, but uh, uh, he 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 expects things to be done in order, in structure, and in design. So we looked at that last week. We looked at uh, uh, aligning organizational structure to strategy. So, for example, we have a strategy for our ministry, right? Say, for example, uh, five years down the line, you want to see uh, your ministry, you know, uh, uh, having maybe two locations, uh, providing certain Bible college classes, right? For example, so so you need to think ahead and align uh, the organizational structure to that strategy. So for example, if you, as we just said, if you want to start a Bible college three years down the line, so you need to prepare, you need to, uh, okay, now look at how I can raise leaders uh, who will be uh, you know available to teach and you need to train them up. So again, it's a process. So we looked at uh, in the book of Numbers how God told uh, the people of Israel uh, right, uh, through Moses. Now, they are, the, the strategy is to get into the promised land, right? But while during the Exodus, God gives them, uh, you know, so many uh, um, structures to follow. Right, there was organization. There was uh, everything was organized. So, uh, uh, God tells Moses, "You have a tabernacle, uh, and then that will be in the middle. You will have three tribes in each corner of the tri tabernacle. So that's twelve tribes, and then each tribe will have one leader, one representative, and uh, and then there will be different kinds of trumpets. So we saw things was in order, even when uh, you know uh, when a trumpet was blown." Uh, for example, to move from one place to another, uh, uh, they would move in an orderly fashion. First, this tribe goes, then the second tribe. So everything was in order. And then uh, uh, if they were to camp as well, it was done in order. Right. So uh, we see that when God, later on, even as he spoke to Solomon, uh, he gave Solomon even the measurements Right. And we look on further on in many other places how God very strategically uh, organized, uh, you know, things in the Bible, especially we see in the Old Testament, very strategic uh, uh, to the dress of the high priest, to the way the offerings are to be made, to to the way how uh, the, 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 the high priests are to, you know, walk into the tabernacle all each and every aspect um, god had an, a, a structure for it and we also looked at the reason for having an organizational structure is because it provides sustainability right uh, we look at the example of david king david 
when he brought the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant to uh, uh, Jerusalem after he became king, he desired that there should be worship in front of the tabernacle. So he chose 4,000 people, 288 prophetic singers, and he divided those 4,000 into 24 units, and each unit will take turns. So probably uh, each unit had about uh, 600, 700 people. We don't know, but those 24 units, so they take turns. So because of this organizational structure, there was worship for 33 years, 24-7, in front of the Ark of the Covenant. You see, sustainability. David was able to sustain. It was not, you know, David had this desire, okay, uh, can we have 24-7 worship in front of the tabernacle? And he didn't just say, okay, uh, who can sing, who can play uh, instruments, come stand. No. He had the desire. He put it on paper, so to say. And then he made sure that, uh, you know, this organization, uh, uh, things are done in an orderly manner. And, and when we do that, we will see sustainability. Uh, even when you look at, uh, you know, uh, ministries, uh, especially when you're starting off in small ministries, you just got 9, 10 people, 15 people, 20 people. It's a small ministry. Get organizational get get structure from uh, the beginning itself so that as the church grows as the ministry grows you will see sustainability you will see things are set in place right? and that's very important it's very important when when things are set in place there's always sustainability you know you, uh, and sustainability will always you know casually over time bring greater and greater growth right so we looked at that we stopped at here last week uh let's pick up from have having the right teams right now uh let me just check what page we are on page of the notes 53 on the notes have the right teams in place right? uh, as we you know, are in you know in a workplace or in ministry, it's very important to have the right teams, because remember that uh, work by God's design is teamwork, right? Uh, very, our Lord Jesus Himself, He could have you know just come, uh, had a two three people and you know no, He didn't do that. Uh, the Lord Jesus had a team, twelve people. Right, so having the right teams in place is very, very important. Right now, uh, here's something that we must understand: uh, having teams, people will come, people will go. You can't stop that. But over time, you will recognize, uh, you know, these are people who can uh, be involved closer to you in your team. Let's look at the example of David again. David was. Israel's most successful king, he, he, he was politically, administratively, militarily, spiritually, the most successful king, right? But one of the things that David did was he set teams in place, right? Like we saw here, he had the worship team, 4,000 odd people. But in, in terms of uh, the army, again, he had strong units. He had... Uh, 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 the 37 warriors, uh, what he, you know, who he had under his team. And those 37, uh, out of those 37 were the, fa the famous 30 leaders. And then in that, uh, David had three in his core team. So we see here, uh, so wonderful. He's got a bigger team, right? Uh, th 37 people. Out of the 37, he had 30 in a closer unit to him. And out of the 30, he had three who was the most valiant soldiers, very closest to David, right? Like a core team. So this is something, some, uh, this is something that we all can, you know, imply in our, uh, or apply in our uh, ministry, in our work, is to work in teams, have smaller units. So for example, you may be, uh, maybe 20 people in the church, I remember when we came to Mangalore, we were 10 people and uh, I called four of them from the, from the 10 people and I said, we are going to start a core team. 
they were all laughing uh, we are only 10 how will you start a core team uh, who's going to be in the core team when i remember four of them i said let us look at what we want to achieve this year so core team i would i would share everything and then we had an, a, a team where of course we were only 10 then as we grew uh, uh the the core team was there then we had another team which was involved in volunteering uh you know there are people for example there are church members who come attend church and they are not able to serve so they you know go back uh, then there are people, youth or so, so a few families who want to serve so they, they serve and then you have the core team where every sometimes decisions that we have to make we check with the core team what do you think about this and uh, and so it's very important to have those teams in place the having the right people in the right in the right team is what is the key here just because i want to make a team uh, okay let's me choose some people no right uh, having the right people in the right team uh, and we should know that you know as a team we all want to succeed so these are things as leaders we must always put forth to our team members right so for example in in church in the ministry you can always tell your church uh, or your core your, your teams now uh, these are the uh, you know what we want to achieve for 2022 these are the things we want to achieve uh, so uh, you know you lead the way right and and let them know that it's not only about you know uh, me and it's not only about uh what i am doing in the ministry but it's a team effort right uh here's the thing with the team effort uh when you succeed involve everyone everyone succeeds but when there's a failure we are also involved in that because sometimes we say okay when we succeed everyone are involved but failures i say because you did it or because he didn't do this or because he didn't pointing fingers remember teamwork is we all succeed or when they fail we all fail and then we are able to you know stand up again uh there will be ups and downs it's not an easy task to set up a good team uh but eventually you will you will arrive at having the right people in the right place uh the next point is very interesting sometimes you know uh the teams that your best teams begins with the most unlikely uh people or even at the most unlikely season or even in the most unlikely uh place uh, and, and so when we look at uh, first samuel chapter 22 1 and 2 let's read this first samuel chapter 22 1 and 2 yes. could one of us please read that for samuel 22 1 and 2 Is anyone there or was Samuel 22 all right yes Samuel thank you 22 1 and 2 David fled from the city of Gath and went to the cave near the town of Adullam when his brothers and the rest of his family heard that he was there they joined him people who were oppressed or in debt or dissatisfied went to him about 400 men in all and he became their leader amen thank you mangi so here the 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 verse starts with david fled from uh you know from the city of gath now in this time david's already anointed as king but he is moving from one place running from one place to another hiding from saul right and it's not a good feeling right to live in fear to live in doubt to when where is samuel sorry where is saul when is he going to come where are his uh, soldiers you know continual fear it was a low point in david's life right although he was destined to be king uh, uh right he was wandering from cave to cave but at that time right david's brothers and other men 
saw David. Uh, they found out, okay, David is here. They came, 400 men came and said, David, we want to be under your leadership. And here started David's mighty army. Excuse me, sorry. 400 men, right? Uh, imagine he's hiding in the caves, probably not when well-dressed, uh, you know, but 400 men, God sent 400 people to David. They said, David, you, we know that you are a leader. We have seen you kill Goliath. We have seen you uh, the way you are. Uh, we've seen that you, as a, uh, you can be a great leader. Uh, uh, so we want to be under your leadership. They knew David's capabilities. They came. Now imagine one person running away from Saul. All of a sudden, he's got 400 mighty men under him. Right? Uh, and it was in a place where, you know, it was very unlikely. Right? Who Who's going to come and, uh, you know, be uh, under the leadership of somebody whose life is in threat? But that's what happened here. Unlikely place, unlikely moment, in an unlikely manner, right? So sometimes when we start out uh, in making teams, building teams, uh, it may not look perfect. It may not just be, okay, this is the exact team I wanted. No. There will be times, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 the, God will take us through seasons and then you say, okay, uh, and at the unlikely time in an unlikely manner god is able to bring the right people in your team so so don't be uh, alarmed if people come people leave uh, let me share this when uh, when we came to mangalore uh, the first sunday when i was there we were about 10 people and there was a young couple right so i was very happy okay there's a nice young couple we can you know uh, you know, they can slowly grow in the Lord and start serving. And uh, so I was uh, excited to talk to them. And uh, so I was talking to them. I said, uh, so, you know, uh, do you all serve in any area? So they were very fervent, right? They, they've they been serving in the church for a long time. And But after the whole conversation, he said, uh, Pastor, please pray, because next week is our last Sunday. We are moving to Canada. And I was like, oh, God. Firstly, we were 10 people. And now this nice young couple. Uh, I thought to myself, you know, I wish they were here. I wish they could be part of the team. You know, that's what we need, people who like to serve and a young couple. And uh, uh, But they had to move to Canada. I was so uh, disappointed. But, uh, you know, we know that you know, they had to go ahead with their future and things. But. Uh, but in the terms of the church, I was disappointed, saying, God, how do we, you know, do this? And a uh, couple of Sundays down the line, uh, I remember we were, I was just, you know, outside uh, the church. I was uh, trying to get some things out. And this young man came to me and he said, uh, uh, you know, uh, I've been walking around this road, uh, this street for a long time. Is there a church anywhere? And um, uh, so I told him, yes, uh, there's a church here and uh, uh, please come, you can come. And he came He and he, his wife was also there. So he came and they came, they sat in the church. That was the first Sunday. And uh, they, they from that Sunday to now, uh, they've been serving so faithfully. They are part of the core team, leaders. Uh, so very unlikely way. And this family brought another family and they again also started serving and being very faithful to church. So uh, it happened on the street, right? So there will be times when people come, people go, uh, but the Lord will, you know, uh, bring in in the right way, in unlikely manners. He'll bring in people into your uh, team, into your ministry, bring in the right people. Uh Another point to remember is to believe in your team. See beyond their struggles, right? Uh, let's read Mark chapter 16, 9 to 15. Mark 16, 9 to 15. Yes, Could one of us please read that. Mark 16, uh, 9 to 15. 
Now when he rose early on the first day of this of the week, he appeared first to the Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him, as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another from from two two of them, as they walked and went into the into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe believe them either. And later he appeared to eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked the unbelief and hardness of heart, because they were, they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, "Go into the world and preach the gospel of every creature." Amen. Amen. Thank you, Abinas. This is a very interesting scenario. Three and a half years, the Lord Jesus has his core team, twelve people. One of them betrayed him, and he saw the end of his own uh, life. And then the eleven are there. They saw Jesus being crucified. Right now, in their mind, Jesus is dead. Jesus is gone. Right. So uh, it didn't even come to their mind that Jesus had kept telling them after three days, I will rise again. Uh, they, but the point is, they have seen the body. They have seen the crucifixion. They've seen Jesus dead. Um, and in their minds, they were assured that Jesus is no more. And so when Mary Magdalene and the others came and reported, hey, Jesus is alive, uh, they did not believe the reports. No, no, no. How can it be? We have seen Jesus' death. We have seen him. And they put him in the tomb. And it's three days now. They did not believe. They were the chosen disciples. They were the men closest to Jesus. Jesus personally trained them. I know that they were the core team. Now picture, they were, if you read the Gospels, there were thousands of people following Jesus. But Jesus was with the twelve. So they knew everything about Jesus, right? The same 11 people did not believe in Jesus. But here's what Jesus did. Jesus did not say, I put my faith in you. I put three and a half years of, you know, uh, all my hard work. We went together. We, you saw all these miracles. How can you deny me? How can you do this? Jesus did not go in that. You see the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He does not condemn us. Right? But what does he do? He corrected them. And he said, he didn't say, okay, now after three and a half years, I have to choose, you know, another 20, 12 people so that, uh, you know, at least they believe in me. No. He corrected them and he used the same 12 people, 11 people. And he said, go into the world, gave them the great commission, gave them this big vision. And the vision was not a small thing. Go into the world, preach the gospel. Now, if you think about it, these people didn't even believe that Jesus rose from the dead. How can Jesus give them the commission to go such a big commission? Jesus believed in his team. At that moment, they were struggling in faith. They could not comprehend what was happening. That was a season of struggle that they were going through. But Jesus knew once they go past that moment, they will be equipped, they will be empowered, uh, and they will give their lives for the mission. So he was placing before them something that was a great vision, a great mission, and he knew that he could count on them. But he also corrected them, and he rebuked them for their unbelief. But he did not give up on them. This is something that is very important as leaders. The Lord Jesus did not give up on his team in their failures. You and I are to believe in our team because we've invested in them. Right? We, we've invested in them, uh, whether it's in the workplace, whether in ministry. Right? Uh, there are times, uh, you know, sometimes, I, uh, uh, you know, you you you've probably ministered or you have a team and they have been with you 10 years, for example. Then they decide to move out, uh, maybe a better job opportunity or a, uh, they, they want to start their own ministry 
whatever it is do not you know hold them back do not hold a grudge on them i don't say okay no i was with you you you, know, you were with me for 10 years now you have to stay with me don't do that believe in your team in a way that okay if there's something better for them something which they can grow uh, and and do better in their life bless them and send them on their way but you have done your part of 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 nurturing and building them up right uh, that's what the lord jesus did he believed in his team he gave them the commission and he sent them that right? even though that that season was not too good for them uh he he trusted them so believe in your team um uh, you know some of the things uh, i remember when uh we were a few people uh i would tell the team let's go out on street ministry and they would say oh uh, pastor i don't think we can do this uh, so i told them see you can do it uh, i'll i'll teach you we, we will uh, we will learn together so i would i would teach them how to talk to uh, you know students uh, how to share and then we all used to go on street ministry and eventually now it's a habit you know of course post uh, after lockdown during the lockdown we could not go uh, but all of us go right uh, so uh, believe in your team just because they say i can't do it don't give up on them encourage them give them ideas give them strategies tell them the, that god is there with them to empower them able to do it so believe in your team with just the right people you can overcome the odds uh Judges chapter 7 verse 7 says God said to Gideon I'll use the 300 men who lapped at the stream to save you and give Midian into your hands all the rest may go home Now this is a interesting event that happened here uh, if you read the entire story uh, Gideon is ready to go fight against the Midianite army right and so he tells God God uh, I need this team I need a good team to uh, because the Midianite army is a, a strong army and uh, Gideon was there he was ready to go he had 32000 men uh, in the army but 22000 people were fearful and afraid so God said those who are fearful go back home so he was left with 10000 people out of the 10000 people God picked 300 people and he said remaining go back home right? and uh, the way he chose them was very interesting he said uh, go and drink water from the river and those who lapped the water which means they took the water in their hands this way and drank the water uh, god chose those 300 men reason being was uh, that is a sign of readiness uh, a posture of alertness uh, and so these 300 men went to battle against a vast gideonite army right but god stepped in there were maybe thousands of people on the midianite army you got 300 people here and they went gideon won the battle and there was peace in the land of israel for 400 people so sometimes we don't need a large team you don't need uh, 50 people or 100 people in your team at times sometimes you need just 15 people with the right understanding with passion with zeal with determination uh to do things right it's not about only having a big uh team the right people is needed and uh so uh, uh people who are committed to the vision of the Uh, of the organization that's what you need right there's no point of having you know uh, uh, maybe 100 people in the team and out of the 100 uh, 50 people are not when committed uh, 50 people are thinking about other things no uh, so what did god tell 22000 were afraid send them home there's no point of going into the battlefield in fear send them home and so god chose just 300 and through that he uh you know he was able to defeat the midianite army with the right people in place uh we can overcome the odds get the right people on board so when when we say get the right people on board it is a it is a journey right 
uh, of course you choose some people they come they may go uh, again building teams is a journey remember apostle paul even in his ministry he chose people he he chose teams he chose people to be with him and uh, uh, and eventually he came up he had a nice strong team with him so get the right people on board uh, design for maximized function and performance right now one of the institution that god uh, uh, you know set up by god is the church uh, if you see the picture of a human body uh, uh, you know there are different organs different sizes different muscles and they all function together in order each unit is kept in place uh, and each unit has to collaborate with each other so what is design you know i love that verse we have fearfully and wonderfully made when you read psalms 139 it it uh, pictures such a beautiful uh, portrayal of our lives it says uh, he knit us together in our mother's womb the meaning you know to knit i think women will know better uh, to knit it, it, it's not you don't do things uh, you know randomly or arbitrarily uh, knitting is a process where you very uh, carefully knit so that you don't get the wrong cord in the wrong place uh, so if you want to make a a a, a a towel or a, a table cloth uh, with a design on it it's it's not easy you got to you know be very careful you need to know which cloth goes which color goes where the lord god knit us together in our mother's womb that means what we were we were created in a in a beautiful way the right size not too big right function what it is suitable for right position right collaboration of all the parts of the body uh contributing and sharing together right uh and important another important thing is to lean uh to stay lean and stay flat right uh, now i won't we won't read this entire portion exodus 18 13 to 36 but let me tell you what happened moses is leading the people now there's smaller problems happening now when he got 600,000 people moses can't go and solve all these small problems so then his uh, father-in-law says why don't you do this you you make teams you uh, and and you know you get people to uh, look after the different uh, processes involved uh, in dealing with the people and and so more so that moses himself could be more focused on uh bigger things bigger issues going to god hearing from god uh, and so moses delegated the responsibility to people now delegation uh is to empower people right so for example um you know uh, uh, uh you have a ministry right and you say okay you ask somebody one of your team members why don't you lead the prayer why don't you be the uh in charge of making a roster for the prayers in the morning then you have a worship pastor you delegate okay worship pastor you make sure that every week there's a worship team set in place they practice they come then you got a uh, ushering team right and and so you got different teams so that's delegation uh eventually here are the things that moses set up under his leadership right a judiciary process leaders of thousands hundreds fifties and tens exodus 18 talks about it right uh journey coordination right 12 tribes 12 leaders okay so for example uh, you know moses wanted to convey something to the tribe of judah so okay he'll say the leader of the tribe of judah comes moses conveys or joshua conveys things so it was there was good coordination so moses didn't have to go searching where is this tribe sitting or where are they camping how do i go who do i speak no it was all you know, uh, set up governance 70 elders appointed to govern and address daily needs this was a wonderful move so moses does not have to worry you no know, about these smaller uh, daily problems you know he did this this tribe people came here 
the smaller problems. Moses could not deal with it, you know. Uh, and, and so governance was also set in place. Special task force, the 12 captains from each tribe to go and spy into the land of Cana. Then you have the religious responsibilities. So he said, let's have priests. The priests in place will look after the religious uh, you know, uh, all the sacrifices, look after the services in the tabernacle, everything that needs to be done. So Moses doesn't have to worry, is the tabernacle all right? Uh, are the things in place? Uh, are the offerings being set in place? Is is everything okay? He didn't have to worry about that. He knew the priests are going to handle that. And then Levites. Levites were the assistant to the priests. So the priests, again, they delegated responsibilities to the Levites. So they work together as a team. So delegating responsibilities is very powerful. As leaders, don't keep everything, you know, uh, don't do everything on your own. As much as possible, try to delegate. Now, it's not like you're, uh, you know, pushing off work to others. It's not that way, especially in ministry. When you delegate, you're empowering people, right? Uh, so what I do is for our worship team, I give the church key to the you know the the drummer. They're all part of the worship team. They've been for many years. So I tell the worship team, you have to come early, and we'll open the church. We'll have a quiet time, right? I uh, you know we uh, you need to set things right, check your instruments, uh, set everything go over the songs, think about the songs that we're going to play, sit for some time, relax your mind, and then we'll get into a time of prayer and worship. So initially, I was doing that. Then I realized I need to delegate this. So I made one person a leader on the worship team. I said, you will make sure that uh, the worship team comes and does this. Uh, it was not a, It's not something very big, but what am I doing? I'm empowering. We're empowering the church members. I say, okay, uh, telling this other, the youth, I tell them, okay, you are in charge of the FTV packets or the first time visitor packets, and you're in charge of uh, making sure that hospitality is done the right way within the church. So I'm empowering. And the students get excited. Wow. Okay, so I'm in charge of this. So I need to make sure I do it the right way. Uh, of course, uh, there will be times when people take it casual. Uh, don't just throw them out of the team. Okay, you didn't do well. Remember Jesus? He was patient and he believed in the team. So tell them, okay, see, even though it's a small church, when we do it right, you know, uh, I remember for Christmas, I said, okay, I chose two girls and I said, you will, uh, I delegate them and I said, make sure that the church decoration is done in a nice way for Christmas. And I gave them uh, the you know, I told them here the decorations are, you can do it in a nice way. You need help. You can go to Google, go to YouTube, check videos, put in your own thoughts. And they did a wonderful job. I didn't have to worry about it at all. Uh, they, they did everything. And then they also removed everything. And, and they were very happy. They said, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. It was something small. But when you delegate, you're empowering them. You're giving them uh, the, the feeling that they are important in the team, right? Uh, so in ministry, delegate, delegate. And when you delegate, give them instructions. Don't just delegate and say, okay, do this. Give them instructions. Give them ideas. Give them strategies. Give them plans. Let them know that you're there for any help. Let them know that it's okay to make mistakes. Uh, we can learn together, right? Uh, so with this, we close chapter six, we'll move into chapter seven and we've got 10 minutes more, uh, but we will move into chapter seven and we will look at innovation and creativity. Now, God is a God of creativity, right? Uh, okay, Kennedy has got a question here. Did you encounter people who discouraged you when you started at Bangalore Church? How did you handle that in relation to your performance? Okay. Uh, Yes, there will be times, Kennedy, uh, people, if, if not discouraged, but uh, people may say things uh, which, you know, they, they may say it meaningfully, but it, it, we may get discouraged at times. Uh, so, for example, 
uh, there will there, there will be times when people say, uh, you know, uh, the song that you sang, especially during worship, the song that you sang, uh, uh, you know, it was it was too fast. The words we could not even sing. It was too high. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, genuine. Uh, uh, but there are times that you just have to uh, understand that okay, uh, it's part. You take you take advice. You take suggestions that they give you, uh, but. Don't let it affect your performance. If it's if it's good, uh, if it's uh, you know uh, uh, they bringing correction to help us, if it's helpful for us, definitely take it. Right? Uh, uh, there will be many many times. Right? People have. There was this one time somebody came and said, "Don't wear a black shirt while leading worship." And uh, so people remember that there are different kinds of people. Right? Uh, different kinds of uh, uh, temperaments. So the thing is, we must understand that we are serving God. We're serving people, yes. We are serving God as well. So let it uh, intentionally tell yourself, no, I, I, okay, if I've fallen in this area, I'm going, I need to, you know, pick up. I need to, uh, you know, improve myself in that. Uh, so constructive feedback, very important. Take it, improve it in your uh don't be discouraged and say I'm never going to do that again. So that would be the wrong thing to do. Right? Yes, Mangi, uh, you raised your hand. Thank you, sir. Um, just sometimes in in an organization, you you present it with two type of types of people. Uh, one they like to save, but they're unskilled and. Yeah, they, whatever you do, they cannot learn or get to the level where you want them to get. Mm. And second group is skilled one, but undisciplined. Yeah. How do you deal with those two type of people? Thank yeah, you. That, that's a good question, Mangi. We look at that in this uh, chapter also, but uh, let me just answer your question. Right. Now, especially in working as a team, you will have people who are very skilled and people who are still learning. Right. Now, if you have people who are very skilled but undisciplined or you know not uh, uh, or causing trouble causing strife within the team uh, even though they are you know uh, contributing maybe 80% of uh, work towards the team as a leader it's a very difficult choice to make but the right choice to do is to correct this person in the team who's Maybe they, you know, sometimes, you know, they, people are very skilled, they do everything and they feel that they can get away with everything, right? Uh, but the right thing to do is to correct that person. If you don't see correction, you, we need to put the team above the individual. I always remember that. The team is above, supersedes the individual. The individual may be giving 80% towards the team, but after correction, after, you know, uh, maybe two corrections and uh, telling him that, you know, we need to work this way. I know that, you know, contributing towards the team, but uh, I see there's strife. I see there's bitterness. I see that you don't uh, treat the others with respect uh, and, 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 you know, you're not uh, following certain rules of the organization. Remember, the team supersedes the individual. So for the benefit of the team, you have to let this person go. Two is, yes, there will be people who find it difficult to learn. And uh, it's not easy. But again, I would say if they are honest, if they are hardworking, and they genuinely want to learn, eventually they will grow. They will learn. It's better to have people who are, you know, humble and hardworking. Performance, it will come slowly as they keep learning, as, they, as you give them opportunities. Performance will increase. It has to increase. It will increase, right? It may take time, but then on the bigger picture, your team is united. Your team is stronger. So always remember, Mangi, uh, the, the team supersedes the individual, right? Of course, we, we do feel bad that, hey, this person, you know, is doing so well in the team. Uh, but I cannot put the team at risk. I can't put all maybe 15 of them, in, 14 of them in the team uh, 
uh, I can't put them all at a place of discomfort and uh, uh, just to, you know, just because this guy is a performer. No. Uh, I do give, you know, you can give them correction, give them two opportunities, tell them, okay, this is warning one, then uh, you give them a warning letter or and then you tell them, okay, strike two, uh, we will have to let you go. Uh, so so that that has to be done, yes. Mangi, I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, especially in, uh, you know, in organizations, in the workplace, IT companies and, you know, in business, it's easy to tell them, right? Uh, and sometimes in businesses, they don't, they just tell the person, who's performing okay you just do what you have to do uh, but then that's a wrong thing to do because um, you need to make the team happy yeah, the team needs to be united so uh, in ministry telling people to letting go of people is hard uh, but then again we correct and love we uh, uh, we look at that in this chapter as well we look at a few things how to bring correction and uh, uh, look at other opportunities as well for uh, team members, right? Okay, we have just three minutes left. What we'll do is we'll uh, start this chapter seven tomorrow. Uh, from now, we'll just go a little quick uh, because we have quite a lot of content to follow. So we, uh, I may not be touching each and every point, but what is very important, the points that are important, uh, we will dwell on it, we will spend time on it, uh, but we'll move a little fast so that we can complete this uh, entire portions uh, for the semester. All right, any other question, any other thoughts? Uh, we can close. Okay, all right, uh, let's close in prayer. Uh, one of us can, Abhinas, is it okay if you can clo close in prayer for us? Yeah, sure, Pastor. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> okay, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful time and the moment that you have given us, Father God. Thank you for the teaching, Father God, that you are providing us, Father God. Thank you, Father God, for teaching us, Father God, for all the hidden things, Father God, all the valuable things, Father God, in our life. Yes, Father God, as we are letting, Father God, help us to, to recognize the things, Father God, and make it plan, Father God, make it structure, Father God, so that we can move ahead, Father God. And Father God, as we are going, Father God, we pray for our all the fellows, Father God, and we pray for all our teachers, Father God. Give them wisdom and the knowledge and the revelation more and more, Father God, so that we will go and equip, equip your kingdom, Lord Jesus, as together, Lord Jesus. We pray and submit all things into your mighty hand, Father God. We ask this pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Abhinas. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day ahead. I'll see you tomorrow. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. God bless.